And so really it's when and where do sediments have an important impact on nitrogen cycling and low uh, dissolved oxygen impacts. Most of the work has been done in a few shallow inlets. There have been a smattering of samples from deeper sites, but um, nothing large scale, not certainly enough to be able to even estimate the average effect of sediment water exchange on nutrient cycling and dissolved oxygen consumption. This is a significant gap in the understanding of how the sediments affect water quality in Puget Sound. And with that in mind, we um, set out to try to begin to fill some of that gap. There's the flux of dissolved organic carbon, which is a direct measure of organic matter breakdown, ought to roughly equal the oxygen consumption. However, if these reduced byproducts are stored, then those two fluxes would not be equal. Or if something happens and say, buried iron sulfide is mixed to the surface where it can re be reoxidized, then the oxygen consumption rate might be greater than the organic matter mineralization rate. And I bring this up because we'll see in the data that we've collected that it's very likely that oxygen consumption is decoupled from organic matter um, breakdown, at least at the times that we studied um, these processes. Let's begin with um, this large scale survey that happened in spring um, at 40 stations throughout the Sailor Sea. On the left panel, you can see the dissolved oxygen flux. This is the amount of oxygen consumed by the sediment. And then the right panel is the dissolved in organic carbon flux. That's the amount of CO2 essentially produced by the sediments. Note on the left that the oxygen flux varies from about five to 25 millimole per meter squared per day which is on average greater than the DIC flux, which varied from about five to 20. This suggests that oxygen consumption is not just controlled by the breakdown of organic matter, but something else is happening in the sediments to, to consume oxygen because the flux of oxygen is greater than we would expect given the flux of dissolved inorganic carbon. But the difference between what we expected the nitrogen flux to be and what we measured um, is our estimate of denitrification. And like the other fluxes we've measured, there's a strong variability in denitrification, that our estimate of denitrification is greater than the nitrate flux. Now, denitrification is the conversion of nitrate to nitrogen gas. There's also another process called anamox, which combines ammonium and nitrite and produces nitrogen gas. Um, the fact that the denitrification rates are greater on average than the supply of nitrate from the water column suggests that much of the denitrification that's occurring in the sediments is something called coupled um, nitrification denitrification. In other words, but we, what we don't know is what is controlling this variation that we observed from site to site that there's no relationship whatsoever between the amount of organic matter being broken down in the sediment and the amount of nitrogen being released or taken up by the, the water column. We hypothesize, and I'll show data that su supports this in a minute, that this dissolved oxygen uptake by the sediment is caused by the remineralization of these stored reduced compounds that perhaps arrived after the spring bloom but in spring, before the, this happened before the spring bloom, much of the oxygen consumption is actually reoxidizing sort of old reduced compounds like iron sulfide. It suggests that the sediments have a memory and that oxygen consumption is sort of, there's some hysteresis or it's prolonged over the course of the year. It doesn't just correspond to the arrival and breakdown of organic matter. It's at least one way to sort of show the big picture of how the fluxes that we measured are related to environmental parameters we measure, like water depth and salinity and grain size and organic matter content of the sediment. So um, this correlation between the hydrogen ion flux and the dissolved oxygen flux is consistent with the idea that much of the oxygen consumption in the sediment is reoxidizing 
stored reduced compounds. Anybody out there has water column respiration rates in the main basin of Puget Sound, I would love to get a hold of them. So the main reason for the higher rates of, um, or the higher fraction of oxygen removal in the South Sound is because it's relatively shallow. We had relatively um, high rates of um, oxygen consumption by the sediment and low rates of water column respiration in Hood Canal. Hood Canal has the largest effect of denitrification, mainly because the bottom water residence time is long enough that there's plenty of time for denitrification in the sediments to remove a significant fraction of nitrogen from the water column. Finally, I've just begun to investigate the role of sediment burial of denitrification than the rest of Puget Sound. We hypothesize that when the organic matter first hits the sediment, anaerobic processes release dissolved organic carbon, produce these reduced compounds, which are stored in the sediment for a period of time before they're finally oxidized. And so in the springtime, this relationship suggests anaerobic respiration is occurring, which does not consume significant oxygen, and that it takes a while before these reduced byproducts are ultimately reoxidized. Slide. To better understand this relationship, we measured the dissolved organic carbon flux and the dissolved oxygen flux at one station over the course of the year. Like nine, almost 95% of the nitrogen supplied to Bellingham Bay is from deep water inflow. About 4% is from the Nooksack River and less than 2% is from the wastewater treatment plant. More sediment cores show high variability, even among replicates. And if you think about it, <laughs> these sediment cores are eight centimeters in diameter. And we're drawing conclusions about, you know, the main basin of Puget Sound based on tiny sections of the sediment. It's not clear to me what is driving the variation in denitrification. And finally, there are some estimates of burial of nitrogen, and it may be significant, but take home messages. Sediments consume up to 20% of the oxygen demand in some basins of Puget Sound, but there is this memory or hysteresis in the oxygen consumption. That is, oxygen consumption doesn't just correspond to organic matter supplied to the sediment, but there's some other process that stretches out the oxygen consumption over the course of the year. Sulfate, Oxid reduction and oxidation may be the key to understanding this. Denitrification and burial both remove a significant fraction of nitrogen, particularly in Hood Canal, which has a long residence time, and in Bellingham Bay, which is fairly shallow. However, there are still significant gaps in our understanding. Clearly, these processes are gonna be varying seasonally and are snapshots in one time, therefore cannot possibly give an accurate estimate of the overall role of sediment, um, oxygen consumption, and nitrate, nitrogen consumption. Despite 50 years since um, Mario Pumatmat first studied these fluxes in Puget Sound, um, we still have a lot to learn. Uh, thank you. In order to address some of these uncertainties, I'm gonna briefly describe in the last minute I have um, what work we've been doing recently, and these data are from this summer. In order to address the fact that core incubations take a tiny section of the sediment and apply that data to the large swaths of Puget Sound, this summer we tried a different method of estimating denitrification in Hood Canal. The plot you see, um, in the plot you see the, the profile of red dots indicates the nitrogen gas content of the water column, Nitrogen gas is the end product of denitrification, and the blue line indicates the nitrogen gas concentration you'd expect to see if it were saturated. The important thing to note is that there's more nitrogen gas at depth than you would expect. Now, when we first started this project, I was thinking that if I measured nitrogen gas along the length of bottom water in Hood Canal because of estuarine circulation, it would increase as you went along the bottom of Hook Canal. And it turns out 
circulation in Hood Canal is more complicated than we expected. But uh, thanks to Parker McCready and my colleague Sam Kastner, we got data from the live ocean model on vertical mixing rates. And if you multiply the gradient in um, vertical gradient in nitrogen gas by the vertical eddy diffusivity, you can estimate the denitrification rate um, for these two stations. This estimate, because it's in the water column, averages over a larger area of the bottom. And interestingly, we get numbers that fall right within the range that of denitrification rate estimates that we got from our core incubations. So two very different methods give us very similar results. Slide. So let's wrap this up with some tips. When benthic flux chambers and core incubations had been compared, they generally compare fairly favorably. Both benthic chambers and core incubations have their pros and cons. Um, of the model are described in a paper by Samantha Sidlecki et al. Philosophy is that the model is as simple as possible, but that still gets um, a defensively reasonable answer and does it for the right reason. And the right reason means that the rates used in the model are um, constrained by observations. Consistent with uh, what David showed, um, the water column remineralization is uh, quite a bit greater than the benthic. Um, it's an interesting process. In this case, I made all the model output available to them and they did the validation work themselves comparing the model to their observations as opposed to me getting their observations. And that's a, an interesting cultural shift. So the sediment diagenesis model in the Salish Sea model um, is based on uh, de Toro's uh, model in 2001. Um, it's been applied widely, um, also integrated into uh, the ICM model used um, in Chesapeake Bay, and in particular, the water quality uh, analysis simulation program of the EPA WASP. Summary for the sensitivity work that's been done. Um, this has been uh, more recently on settling rates, nitrification and mineralization. The validation, uh, the, the main data set um, that was validated is the same uh, from Rich's group at USGS, which is a compilation across um, 25 sites in the sound, mainly flux chambers. Um, and this is in detail in uh, Pelletier 2017. There was a very little difference between the two overall. That's a peak difference of 0.4 milligrams. Um, furthermore, using um, David's uh, student's work, which was a uh, Merit 2017 that he presented earlier, they looked at three cells shown on the right-hand side um, here, and this was the first direct uh, temporal analysis comparing the time periods of June um, rather than just the, the annual comparison. And they found we're looking at three uh, steps for further modeling analysis um, and comparison to measure data with uh, Puget Sound Institute. Uh, the first is to provide an expanded data set um, for model development um, and undertake a further validation. We hope that will be useful also for the efforts um, uh, that were discussed with uh, Parker earlier. Um, and also um, some folks here on the call from um, Susan Allen's group who are currently developing the sediment exchange as well. Um, there is an intention uh, to have a comparative um, uh, model examination across at least those three models and so perhaps this data set confirm uh, the basis of that going forward. Second here is to examine the model output specifically um, with a bit, little bit more detail on this on the sediment flux response um, to different loadings and then the third here is specific to uh, spin up time and stability. The final validation step here is to consider a direct monthly modeled output to monthly measurements that are available at those sites, extending uh, the approach that was done in our mid-2019 uh, for Bellingham Bay to other inlets shown here. So there is an opportunity across three sites which are shown 
Club Bay and Bellingham. And then the last step here is the springtime comparison across a number of sites, and that's the, the new opportunity. And here it's really looking at how the model behaves and if it's behaving as expected with various loadings across different seasons and depths at these locations. See the sediment exchange spin up and stability analysis. And it's expected this will build confidence in the current parameterization used or may provide information um, on improved initialization data set that could be considered in future. Next slide, please. Now we can look at just comparing some of the preliminary results. So here, we got a little bit excited about working some of this up, and so we did want to share a good discussion today. So bear with us with some drafty preliminary plots and tables. Just so a few slides on some of the data that's um, from Bellingham Bay, Sinclair, and Case. So we're just working up um, some of the measured to model comparison now um, that uh, my colleague Rachel uh, Mueller on this call is working on. And um, With respect to the uh, incubations, of course, I was wondering to what extent are is bioturbation uh, influenced by uh, these uh, whole core incubations, especially um, processes such as bioirrigation or ventilation, which could result in um, strong increases in oxygen consumption as the animals are pumping oxygenated water into their burrows? That's an excellent question. I think the effect of bioirrigation is huge. Um, one evidence of that is that if we measure um, fluxes of these solutes while the boat is running, they're very small. The animals, I think, are frightened. And once we put them into an incubator and turn off the lights and let everything settle down, the rates take off. I'm intrigued that you said that the sulfate uh, reduction, sulfate oxidation may play a strong role, and that's something that's not included in my model. And I was curious, um, and maybe I missed it, but if you could just expand on why that process in particular uh, you think is important. And then sort of part two is maybe more general for modelers or for anybody. Um, how might we parameterize this process in our models without including the full sulfur cycle? <laughs> <laughs> well, you found out in some basins, sediment oxygen can amount to almost 20% of the oxygen consumption but 80% comes from water column processes. So we, while, while we have the sediments implemented through sediment oxygen demand detouros model, we also focused on making sure we got all the other processes sort of balanced out so that it reproduced time series of dissolved oxygen in the surface as well as bottom layers. Um, do you have any um, evidence that places where the disconnect between oxygen demand and mineralization rates is the greatest that there's more reworking. So sediment mixing um, by fauna happening that's bringing metal sulf sulfides up to the surface where oxygen is present. Um, and the next question is also whether the use of micro sensors could be perhaps useful to look at oxygen and hydrogen sulfide concentration gradients to see if they actually meet um, and whether there could be an efflux of hydrogen sulfide um, into the very top layer of sediment where oxygen is uh, present or into the overlying water. 